So often we speak of sins, we think of things that are morally reprehensible or socially unacceptable. If we think of sin as anything keeping us from living openly with God and others, anything preventing us from being the creature God intended, we realize that much of our sin is actually legal or socially acceptable. Let us confess those sins before God and before each other, if we can be in prayer. Eternal and loving God, you comfort, support, and encourage us. Your goodness and kindness go beyond our understanding. Your grace is richer and deeper than we can begin to comprehend. Yet despite your gracious love and faithful care, we seek to go our own way and to trust our own resources. Time after time we choose our plans over your will. Over and over again, our pride, self-reliance, and self-centeredness lead us astray. We confess that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. We admit that we are flawed, broken people in need of mercy. Through the person and work of Jesus Christ, forgive us for all the times we have failed you. Cleanse our hearts and make them fresh and new. Renew our minds for your kingdom's sake. Empower us to be your son's disciples for his glory. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, hear these words regarding prayer. Ask and it shall be given to you. Search and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. Know that God longs to hear our prayer and longs to communicate back. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us, let us live at peace as forgiven people. Psalm 32, a David psalm. Count yourself lucky. How happy you must be. You get a fresh start. Your slate's wiped clean. Count yourself lucky. God holds nothing against you. And you're holding nothing back from Him. When I kept it all inside, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. The pressure never let up. All the juices of my life dried up. Then I let it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. Suddenly, the pressure was gone. My guilt dissolved. My sin disappeared. These things add up. Every one of us needs to pray. When all hell breaks loose and the dam bursts, we'll be on high ground, untouched. God's my island hideaway. Keeps danger far from the shore. Throws garlands of hosannas around my neck. Let me give you some good advice. I'm looking you in the eye and giving it to you straight. Don't be ornery like a horse or mule that needs bit and bridle to stay on track. God defiers are always in trouble. God affirmers find themselves loved every time they turn around. Celebrate God. Sing together, everyone. All you honest hearts, raise the roof.
Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart.
Good morning. Most of you have probably heard of a guy named Mike Rowe, or at least I'm sure the name sounds familiar to you. Uh, a few years back, he had a television series called The World's Dirtiest Jobs, and another show called Somebody's Gotta Do It. And he went all over the country and he uh, checked in with many blue collar workers who uh, worked on garbage trucks or worked at the dump, some of whom worked in sewage treatment plants, uh, some who pumped septic tanks, jobs that most people would consider dirty. Uh, one of the things he did was go to a chicken farm where he helped clean out chicken manure pits that were underneath the cages of thousands and thousands of birds. Uh, and it showed him wandering around in uh, knee-deep uh, chicken manure and and picking out dead chickens and broken eggs and other debris that had fallen down in there and I uh, said indeed this is this is a pretty dirty job but somebody has to do it and his the idea was he was always paying homage to the the unsung heroes that do all those jobs that most people don't want to do but that have to be done and it got me to thinking uh, a little bit about today's scripture. Spiritually and, and, and in the church and in our life together in the fellowship of believers, uh, some jobs are dirtier than others. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today. One of the dirtiest jobs of Christianity, of living together as the people of God, as living together as a family united by our belief and devotion to Jesus Christ. And that part of the Christian life is called forgiveness. Now I know what you're probably thinking, oh we, we do pretty good, we, we forgive and we move on and, and the truth of the matter is, no matter how you, got, how you cut it, forgiveness is hard. It is hard work. And many times it's thankless work as well. You see, just because we forgive somebody for something that they have done doesn't mean they believe they needed to be forgiven, number one, or wanted our forgiveness, number two, or feel like they've even done anything wrong. See, all of which makes it all the harder to forgive people. And for those of us that are, are doing the forgiving, uh, somehow the sins committed against us seem a lot worse than the ones we might have inadvertently committed against others. We have a tendency to minimize the way we hurt other people and a way of elevating the way other people have hurt us. The truth of the matter is, Forgiveness is never easy. It's hard. And it requires effort. The other truth of the matter is this. We are commanded and directed by Jesus Christ to forgive. It's not a suggestion. Uh, it's not an advisement or advice. It's a command. As a matter of fact, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray that, don't we? When we say, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we come to understand as we forgive means in like kind, the same way as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's not a quid pro quo. Don't, don't hear me wrong here. But it is a requirement from Jesus' lips that we need to forgive others. And that's not an easy thing. You know, so we don't forgive other people for their sake. That's another thing that we have to understand. Part of the reason we forgive is not for them. The bulk of the reason we forgive is for us. So we don't let that root 
of bitterness grow in our person, in our personhood, in the way we respond and interact with the rest of the world and indeed with, with other human beings and even with our God. This is the reason why we forgive so we have less to carry. I'm going to say that again. We forgive others so we have less to carry. We want to believe in our own heads we're forgiving them so they have less of a burden, so they have less to carry. Trust me when I say this, much of what you're carrying, much of what you're holding on to in the way of hurt and bitterness and pain and unforgiveness towards others, the person you're holding it on has long ago forgotten what happened. They have walked away unburdened and have been walking unburdened for a very long time. You are the one carrying the burden. So we had our scripture today and when Jesus' disciples came and, and uh, they were trying to do good. They were looking for an attaboy. And they said, well, how many times are we to forgive, Lord? See, the common, the common rule of the day was one and done. You forgive somebody something once, okay, you're a good person. You forgive them twice, you're a foolish person. You probably heard the adage, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. That's where that idea comes from. So th this whole thing of how many times are you to forgive? That was a pretty legitimate question. Now, really holy people might have said, you know what? I'm going to forgive three times because I'm a really good person. I give somebody three times for something, and after that, I don't forgive it anymore. We're done. I will hold against them forever. And that would have been considered gracious. But this was one of Jesus' disciples, and he knew that the bar was higher than it ever had been before. He had heard Jesus' response to other things. He said, so tell us, Lord, how many times are we to forgive? Three or seven times? And I'm sure he thought, oh, seven times? You're doing so good. That's a, that's a good answer. And Jesus said, I tell you this, not seven times, but seven times 70. A little quick math here, folks. That's 490 times. And I'm sure it just flabbergasted the disciples. That, that, that's a huge number that they weren't ready for, one that you could hardly even count. When my kids were teenagers and when I worked in a school, uh, I mean, they, they knew what it meant I, when I said, you know what? You know, they do something and I'd say, that's 489 times. Probably an exaggeration, hyperbole. But they knew what it meant. Uh, the next time it happened, there were going to be consequences. Right? So that meant they weren't going to be forgiven. Something was going to happen. But that's not even the case there. When Jesus said that, he meant, don't bother to keep count. That's the point. Don't keep count at all. Just forgive. And the reason we forgive, again, as I said, is not for them, but for us, for you. And, and it begs the question, if it's helpful to forgive and not be burdened and carry that with you, why do we resist forgiving people? And, and, and there are a few reasons. One, and probably the biggest, is we don't understand what forgiveness means. Forgiveness does not mean forget it. It didn't matter. It did matter. You were hurt deeply. And probably in your head right now you're saying, but Pastor Dan, you don't understand what has been done to me. I, I do understand. And I'm sure you were hurt deeply. That's, and that's why you can't think forgiveness means it doesn't matter, it was no big deal. 
That's not what it means. It also doesn't mean I forget. It's like it never happened. Don't worry about it, it never happened. It's not what it means. You know that it happened, you know the hurt that it caused, you know the pain that you bear, and in some cases the scars that you bear from that incident. But that's not what forgiveness is either. Some of us believe that forgiveness is letting the person off the hook. And I guess that was always my biggest hang up is I'm letting them off the hook. There will be no justice ever because I let them off the hook. I let them go. I forgave. That's not what forgiveness is either. Forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is saying, I choose to be okay. And I'm going to be okay with turning anything that pertains to justice over to God to take care of. And I'm okay with that. I'm also not responsible for you being okay with it. See, that's part of the forgiveness piece. And the other thing is, I am okay with not being the instrument or tool of your judgment, correction, or rebuke from God. I don't even have to be part of it. For those of us that had siblings, you probably remember the times when you came to mom and dad and something had been done and you'd been wrong and mom and dad were the arbiters, but you wanted to have some input on what was going to happen to your sibling. You had some pretty good ideas of what would be a good punishment or a good consequence for the way that you had been wronged. Uh, maybe you didn't, but I know in my family that was the case. Now, I wanted to weigh in on what I thought was appropriate consequence for my brothers for doing something that impacted me. See, that's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is also not um, smiling at each other through gritted teeth, shaking each other's hand, and going, it's okay, I'm sorry, and making the other person say, I forgive you. That's not forgiveness from the heart. It's not real forgiveness, and we all know that. We've probably all done it to our children uh, when they fight with their siblings and, and make them go through that process. The hope is that someday the actions and intents will follow the words, but that's not really forgiveness either now, is it? Forgiveness is a heartfelt turning over of control of the situation, of the hurt, and of the wrong into God's hands. That's what forgiveness is. Well, why would you do that? Well, the biggest reason is it's good for you. Remember when I said the one carrying the burden is not the person who has done the wrong. The one carrying the burden is the one that's wrong and can't get over it, can't get past it. You are arrested in that moment, and you can't move on with your life. Forgiveness is important because it sets us free. Forgiveness of someone takes the power out of the hands of the offender that's holding you and burdening you and gives it back to yourself. For all those reasons, Forgiveness is valuable. It's wonderful. It's a gift. So why don't more of us participate in that free gift that we've been given? The ability to forgive another and unburden ourselves. Here's the truth. It's hard. Our pride has been wounded along with our personality, our psyche, and our emotions. We don't like being made to feel less, and we're angry, and we're hurt. And at the truth, we want to get even. We say we want there to be justice, but what we want is to get even. We want some 
matter of revenge. We want to be emotionally satisfied that the person that offended us has been hurt like we were hurt. And that's really not our job. Our job is to trust in the Lord to take care of all those things. Our job is to forgive the person, not for their sake, but for our sake and for the sake of our relationship with Jesus Christ and not have anything that comes between us and him. So I ask you today, who's the person that's uh, holding on to you, who's burdening you, who's burdening you with a past hurt that you have been unable to forgive? The first step is this. I'm not even going to ask you to actually forgive the person. I'm going to ask you to invite Jesus Christ to be part of that situation, to be part of the circumstances. And I'm going to ask you to pray to trust Jesus Christ to do what he will with that situation and those circumstances. This is the first step in truly forgiving. And I hope you take hold of it. God bless and have a great day. And be a free person. Amen.